Thunderbirds 1965 is a project to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Thunderbirds. We're creating three new episodes of Thunderbirds based on 1960s commercially available stories that were recorded specifically for record. So this allows us to create new episodes that not only will look exactly like they did back in the day, but sound exactly like they did back in the day. We're hoping to revive an art form that is pretty much extinct to bring back the magic of Thunderbirds and Super Mario Nation. Thunderbirds are go! Thunderbirds is a 60s view of the future and of America by people who had never been to either. That in itself makes quite a fun show. On the one level you just had really good stories, stories that were engaging and, and thrilling and exciting. But also they had humour and at the heart of it was a family. They all had to hold on to a secret. When I was somewhere between seven and eight this new programme came on TV, Thunderbirds and it was an instant magical journey for me. I was looking at something utterly tangible. There were so many things to look at, so many visuals, models, puppets, everything was just so cool. I really love the quality that goes into these tiny things. It's such a, a unique form of filmmaking. There is nothing like it on television, either before or since, really. That super marination technique that came from the 60s has an appeal to it that's so specific to it there is a charm to it that doesn't exist in any other medium. The way it was shot was epic, it was filmic. There's something about models and puppets brought together with dynamic editing and this big over-the-top music that really sells what you're watching on screen. Super marionation is a term that Jerry Anderson came up with to sell this idea that you're making this very sophisticated form of puppetry. This is not your Andy Pandy, this is not your Bill and Ben, this is not puppets hanging in front of a board with thick wires and kind of doing this with painted on eyes and painted on mouth. This is a very sophisticated, higher class form of marionette entertainment. When they were doing it in the 60s, they wanted to make live action films. Jerry Anderson hated being associated with puppets. And the goal of that team was make these things as cinematic as possible, have depth to the set. You film them like people, give them close-ups, give them mid-shots, let the camera interact with them as though they're real people. This is an example of a Super Marionation puppet. And what you can see here is you've got this fiberglass head. If you take the back of the head off and you look inside, uh, sorry for anyone who has a weak stomach. This is the eye rocker, and this is actually what allows your eyes to move back and forth. And then you've got an electromagnet down there that when you send the uh, electric pulse through, uh, that's what moves the mouth and causes it to talk. The key core of Super Marionation was that the puppets were able to speak in time with the dialogue, which is really important when you're trying to sell the credibility of something being alive, because everyone we talk to speaks in sync with the dialogue. Jerry Anderson said these puppets can't walk, or these puppets can't pick things up, they have one expression on their face, they have a very static face, but the, the funny thing is, is that those limitations also mean that they can do a lot. There's a very narrow window within which the characters can emote, but they do that very well. You know, if the character looks slightly to the left but lowers its head, you get one expression, you might get coy. If they push their eyes all the way over and look up, they can look snooty. Farewell, Mr. Charles. Your family would have been proud of you. They finished up in jail too, I believe. So when you pair that with dialogue or with the context of a scene, you can get so much emotion, so much performance out of something that, that is so static. You can see their puppets. You occasionally see the strings. You occasionally kind of are aware that they don't move quite like real people. But you, I think it's, it's testament to the stories and the, the, whole, the whole bit that you kind of do feel for them when they're in peril. There's natural perspective 
in the shots. So they, in a bizarre way, they feel more organic mm. than a two-dimensional image ever will, mm. because they can turn and they do have shadows. And the fact that you know they don't move as naturally mm. as us, we bypass that. They didn't realise that they'd ended up creating this rather odd art that has its own unique appeal. You struggle in vain. You, you, you're wasting your time. I, I know nothing. All right, you asked for it. Okay, you've got three seconds to switch off that beam. Look out, Scott. Switch off the beam. Oh, where's the master switch? Oh, Scott, quickly. Now hold tight, Penelope. We were so excited about the fact that mini albums of Thunderbirds existed. They did obviously do mini albums that were just recaps of episodes, but we had these three that were just completely unique to vinyl, really. And the coolest thing about that is, of course, uh, all the voices are there. You know, you've got Peter Dinoly and Shane Rimmer and Sylvia Anderson and David Graham. Making authentic Thunderbirds, you know, 1965 Thunderbirds, you couldn't do it without having those voices. That's the blessing of having those mini albums. The curse of it is that they never designed them to make them into movies. They were made strictly as audio plays, really. And so part of our job has been to adapt them to suit the visual medium. And that involves a lot of careful unpicking of the audio elements, restructuring, inventing new scenes, new bits of business. And it's things like Thunderbird 4 making an appearance in stately homes robberies, a uranium plant which is exploding in the abominable snowman. These aren't in the mini albums, so we've managed to make these sometimes pedestrian mini albums into proper episodes. Deal with that meddlesome lady, Penelope. It takes a lot of patience to make a superhuman puppet, especially because we are doing recreation, so the puppets have to look as right as they possibly can. It takes sometimes weeks for a character to go from start to finish. There's so many processes involved. You start off with a plasticine head, cast it then in silicon rubber, then you make a fiberglass cast of that. You put the work ends in, the eyes and the solenoid, or electromagnet in this case, for the mouth to make the mouth move. Then of course they've got to go off and be wigged. They're difficult puppets to work with, but I think once the technique is perfected, they work. I think they work very well. I think the trickiest things are probably the eyes, because they have to be really, really good quality human style eyes. Lots of people tried to recreate them, but very difficult to do. They've got to be done to a standard and they've got to be done in the same way out of dental acrylics to get that nice clear lens in it. Just like with people, they're the window to the soul, as they say, so they need depth to them. If they're just painted on or glazed over, or if they have this kind of cloud about them, you don't really get that connection. When you put a camera on this character, you can actually feel depth to the character because of the eyes. It seems that most of the sculpts are, are asymmetric. And of course, if you're making anim animatronics, the main thing, is most of it has to be symmetrical because it's actually a mechanical piece. The lip mechanism, for example, works with a, a magnet. And if the magnet is not exactly and I mean exactly where it has to be, the mouth won't move or it will stay open or you will hear a clack but the mouth won't do it. So obviously fitting a, me a mechanically made thing into an organic sculpt which has got character is always a problem. So you don't find this until you finally come to assemble a puppet and find that his, his mouth is over at an angle, his eyes are not quite in line. <laughs> and then it's really playing and trying to get those characters to actually look the same as they would have done in the 60s, because obviously these quirks were what made them characters. We're constantly trying to make it look like the original, which, which you can't do entirely because even their puppets did not look the same between the individual stages. And the tiniest degrees of variance can completely destroy the look that you're going for. We are really sensitive to the slightest changes in people's faces. So if you meet someone and suddenly their eyes an inch to the left, you know, then they look weird. And you know, well, obviously a puppet scale, if it's you know, a millimetre or two out, well, then it might as well be an inch at that scale. 
I think the, the strength of using these marionettes is you have a, a complete figure to work with. They are a complete entity. And you can treat them as a, as a live action actor, really. If you've got a, a full set to go with them, you can place the camera however you like. The limitations, I suppose, really are to do with the way in which the character is remotely controlled by these very long wires. It's quite difficult to get precise movement with them. One of the most important things for a supermarination puppeteer is arm strength, because sometimes you're standing up there, you're holding a puppet for almost an hour um, while lighting is set up and the camera's set up, um, and I think physical strength really helps. It's very easy to forget, you know, on that credit way down somewhere near the end of the list on Thunderbird 5, that the puppeteers, they are the actors. So often we focus on the, on the voice artists. But actually the performance that the characters give, you know, is so important to the way the show works. When you see the puppets hanging from the bridge and all of a sudden the lights go on and the puppeteer grabs the control and starts working it, it suddenly comes to life. They say the soul of the puppet is in the puppeteer's hand. You do a lot of very subtle movements that translate into bigger movements on camera. So you have to be almost almost like a dancer in terms of your muscle control. There's an element of spontaneity and playfulness. It's a lot like theater. You get up here, you have the puppet in your hand, and, it, and so many factors could determine whether or not the performance is what you want it to be. There's an element that you can control it, and even the most skilled puppeteer you know, can get the puppet to a certain place. And then after that, at the end of these long six foot wires, then it's sort of luck. But well, because there's just so much to do, it really does become quite chaotic at times because the puppets are notoriously difficult to work with. You sometimes need three or four people just to get one character to perform a single action. There'll be the operator who's at the top of the bridge. Then you might have a floor puppeteer. A floor puppeteer needs to be on hand to hold a puppet still, to turn a puppet, to lift a hand, to fill in the gaps that the operator on strings can't do. Three, two, one, drop. And your back sort of twisted, your hands like this, you're facing the polystyrene snow, you're facing the dirt, you're facing the sand. <laughs> you look amazing. And then you've got the lip sync operator, you know, who has to make sure that the dialogue is keyed in time. The lip sync system that we use here is different to the system they'd have used in the 1960s on the original series in that it was transmitted down the wires. We have a cable that goes up the leg and up the body because the strings become very brittle when you transmit the signal down them. We also have to activate the lip sync manually as well, so we have a switch. As the dialogue goes, you have to press in time to the lip movements, which can be quite difficult when you have a long passage of dialogue. Lip movement is something that people do associate with the puppets, and examples in the series where the lip sync doesn't work or it's wrong, it's very noticeable. It does throw people off, so I suppose in a way it is an extension of the puppeteering itself. The wonderful unpredictability of life, for me, is contained in getting a message saying, how would you like a puppet recreated in your likeness? And you kind of go, of all the things, of all the sentences I, I was ever expecting in my life, <laughs> that really yeah. is one of the most unusual. Oh, my dear high-born titled English lady, the evidence is underwhelming. Clues abound in every crook and nanny. I was quite comfortable with the idea of it being very much a period piece and of its time. Now we would do things differently, but, you know, we would do a billion things differently. Mm. The sense of this project was to kind of be as authentic as possible. Mm. So for me, retaining the voices was kind of important and because they pre-exist. Dear friend, we must part. Our destination has arrived. Uh, there is the ski copter and the guy to transport you. Years ago, they had done Cliff Richard and his group as specific little portraits. But I thought, well, if I was back in the 60s, what would I be doing? So I got photographs and things in the same way that they might. Um, and just started sort of sculpting. And I literally sit there, you know, on a, at a table, on a turntable and sculpt away. I didn't draw it beforehand. I just thought, well, I'm just going to sit here and just see how it goes. And slowly, slowly, it, it sort of came to life. And you sculpt the hair on so you can get the final idea of what it's going to look like and so on. <laughs> Virgil, you gotta hurry up! 
even with something so simple like this, when it goes wrong, it can really go wrong. And after all of this time and preparation and you're finally ready to go for a shot, the puppets are in place, the set's perfect, maybe even the explosives are set up and ready to go, you call action and then suddenly <coughs> This uh, tungsten wire that we're using is incredibly fine. Either they loop or the weight is too much for it suddenly and they break so the puppet slumps and we end up having to redo the entire scene all over again after we've restrung them. We, we have certain characters that we really like and we have certain characters that they were always so frustrating and they didn't want to work. You know, the hood was as villainous for us in person as, as he is in the episode. What do you mean? We had this very tricky shot where you had a human hand in the foreground and Steven, the director, was playing Scott Tracy holding the gun up. And then you had the hood in the background, full body, and we were rehearsing this over and over because he had to spin around with a gun. There was a lot of pressure because the, the hood was on set and there'd been a lot of problems trying to get the hood to look right in the first place. And then we turned over and the camera was running and Steven's hand came up. Okay, you've got three seconds to switch off that beam. Sometimes we lose hours, sometimes we lose half a day trying to fix these things. When you watch him, you think, oh, that, that won't take long, that's easy to do. But everything is difficult, nothing is, nothing is what, as what it seems. I wish we had sound on the rushes because when we actually get a take right, there's cheers because the frustration of getting it right is so great that when, when it does actually work, everyone is overjoyed. All right, next shot. Nice. Well done, everyone. The model work in Thunderbirds and all those types of shows is very specific. There's a very specific way that they make their planes fly, that they make the cars drive, the way they film it. Very of its time in terms of the grammar of the way craft are so often going left to right, right to left. I suppose the modern way of filmmaking is to, you know, to make you feel like you're traveling much more with the vehicle or much more in the center of action. Whereas you know, the Derek Medding style of filmmaking is that you're an observer. And if you go back and look at Thunderbirds, they would make their models Filthy. But it's a technique that I think Derek Meddings in the 60s perfected and they had this great sort of eye for making things look realistic. It's a key to the, to the film of models. When does Thunderbird 4 look the best? When it's just absolutely filthy. It looks like it's actually gone out on mission. So our models, we would dirty them down and put them on camera and you know quite often it was a building or a vehicle or whatever, we'd look at it and go, oh, it's not dirty enough. So when you actually see a model in a real life by, under normal light, it looks very, very worn in and dirty. But and in front of a camera, by the time you've lit it, you lose about 70% of the dirtying down. So it's a skill to actually look through a camera and try to make a judgment as to the amount of breaking down of the model. So if, for instance, you put it on something on camera that has to appear brand new, you still have to dirty it down. And if it looks right on the camera, then that's what it has to be, even though you pick the model up and it looks like a piece of rubbish, as long as it looks good on camera. It can be very flimsy, uh, only detailed on one side. The long-term appeal of Thunderbirds, I think, is in the fact it's not about realism. We're not kidding ourselves or kidding anybody. We know when you look at these effect shots, no one's going to think this is real life. It's never going to look like, you know, reality. It's about inanimate objects coming to life and behaving sort of as though they were real. You know, when Thunderbird 2 flies, it's got to look really heavy. Not for one second do you buy the fact that it's anything other than the model. You're not looking to go, oh my God, it looks real. That's what they were aiming for. You know, I think that's really important that, that their special effects, they wanted them to hit realism, but they didn't, you know, at that point they weren't able to. And so they ended up with this world, by luck really, you know, in which the puppets and the models inhabit the same artificial universe. And so it's toys come to life but really good toys come to life. Not the sort of toys that you can own when you're a kid, but the sort of toys that maybe you aspire to own later on, the sort of toys that we're now surrounded with here. So we've been really challenged and pushed on our locations across the three episodes. We have scenes set at uh, an exploding refinery. We've got scenes in the Tower of London, stately home in the home counties. We've got Tracy Island, including bits you've never seen, a multitude of ice caves. You know, you've got to really think on your feet with this sort of stuff. Um, the production is going to stop tomorrow unless you provide the set.
Stephen would come to me and he'd say, well, we want to shoot this tomorrow. What's the possibilities? And Hilton is the master when it comes to identifying bits of kit parts that they used on the original sets and then to reusing those same kit parts on these sets, which is, I think, really important to the success of us convincing the audience that these episodes could have been made in the 60s. Just really hunting down on eBay, trying to find the bits and pieces they used, the little things like the grills, very identifiable and playable things throughout the whole of the Jerry Anderson series. Things like the little bulbs, toothpaste tube tops, and trying to make it as authentic as we could, really. We have to make a long study of the, the styles, the materials, get into the heads of the model makers of the time. So it's trying to find and replicate all the original kits and toys, materials, the way things were painted, the way they were aged. This is the lounge, Penny. I control most of the rescue operations from here. Oh, really, Jeff? It's quite beautiful. Where we're matching something, say the Tracy Lounge, we've had to go back to original episodes as plans for these sets don't exist anymore and really study and work out what the measurements were to make sure they're in correct proportion with the puppets. This room is a room that any fan is intimately familiar with. It might as well be a room that you grew up in. So when we came to make a replica of this, uh, it was incredibly important that it wasn't too big, that it wasn't too small, that you know the colors were right to get it to look right on camera. To get the dimensions right, I took a frame grab of an original episode and then modeled 3D geometry on top of it and took measurements of it with a 3D camera on there guessing what lens they filmed on so we could get the measurements of what, what that was supposed to look like. Say, Fab One sure is a great automobile. We like it, don't we, Parker? Yes, my lady. We had to recreate Fab One, which I think is probably one of the most difficult puppet-sized props they even had on the original series. So we were loaned sections of a Fab One model, which then we had to modify. And I just happened to have, from 20 years ago, some casts from the original uh, Thunderbirds Ago Fab One, which I then reworked to make it look something like the first series car. I can't think of another series where people have attempted to bring it back and do it exactly the same way. Maybe because most of the time it's not possible. If you suddenly decided that you wanted to remake I don't know, 1960s Doctor Who or the Avengers, you know, you, you wouldn't have the actors around. So in that sense, it would be an impossible feat. For us, with these recordings, with the fact that our stars are made of fiberglass, whether they be puppet or vehicle, that's something we can do. If we were producing a new marionette series, I think it would be a lot, lot easier than what we're trying to do now, which is to make an exact recreation of something that was made five decades ago, because if the slightest thing is off, suddenly everything is thrown. You're suddenly not in the 60s. But there are all sorts of things that are part of recreation that you can't really put your finger on. You look at a shot and it either looks like Thunderbirds or it doesn't look like Thunderbirds, or maybe it sort of looks like Thunderbirds, which is the worst sort of shot because you've got to go, oh, well, what's, what's the thing that's letting it down? You know, is it the lighting? Is it the, the, the puppet's face? Getting it as close to what it was is it's very important. So I think there is that added pressure, perhaps unlike if we were making something different in that we'd think, you know, this is what we want, but is it what they would have done? And it has to be the way they would have done. But particularly building something that has to appear, you know, not, not a recreation of Thunderbird 2, not a recreation of a puppet, but those little bits of detailing sets, sets that are built specially for this production, they need to be made in a way that looks like they could have been made in the 60s. One of our big problems with this is sometimes people who have supplied stuff they make it too well. And that's not to run down the original series. And we're doing this using some modern technology and it would be tempting to try and update the way we're doing things, but really you have to keep bringing it back to the 60s. I met Stephen and Geraldine because we were appearing together in a play in Geneva, which I was doing costumes for, and Stephen sidled up to me towards the end and said, would you be interested in doing something a bit bizarre? Our costume lady, Liz, was thrown in the deep side of the pool when we told her, OK, now you've got so many weeks, we want so many costumes, they have to be teeny tiny, they have to fit perfectly, they have to have the right pattern, and uh, we want them 60s. 
get to it now. And she managed great. So we got so many costumes from her. They all look fantastic. The attention to detail is always really good. To research it, I was more looking at costumes of the 60s than the actual Thunderbirds costumes. And in fact, looking at the Thunderbird costumes, you can see that they got very excited by all these new futuristic fabrics like polyester, which is why so many of the costumes are very rigid on the original Thunderbird marionettes because polyester just has very little give. What works really well is anything that's a tad on the stretch side. So, for example, this um, has some elasticity to it. It's not easy to find details and patterns that work for puppets because anything, this for example, these stripes would look massive and the puppet would look well, puppet-sized. And we did find some, like Jeff's flamingo shirt, which is just gorgeous and it's perfect for Jeff. And you think, what would anyone in the real world want to use half quarter centimetre high flamingos on, on a bit of fabric for us? Very bizarre, can't work that one out at all. And you can tell Jeff's costumes. There's something a bit kind of odd about them. He's got a bit of a peacock in him. Uh, which again was a very 60s thing, I mean, it was this thing called the Peacock Revolution. Uh, bring the luggage, will you, Parker? Uh, yes, my lady. I'll have to make several trips. You've brought a lot of gear. Parker, when one's visiting, one tries to look one's best. To be honest, I don't like Lady Penelope. I really don't. She's a stupid, unnatural size and you continually have to keep saying to yourself, she's not Barbie, she's not Barbie, she's not Barbie, but she's shaped like Barbie. Again, I was quite happy when I could make her into slightly formal, more masculine clothes, if you like. And action. Well, I must say, Barbie, it was a good idea of yours to bring that one along. So much more convenient. Yes, the lady. Sort of knew it would be as close to the 1960s experience making the original series as, as would be possible. Um, but it just completely surpassed my expectations. Probably one of the strangest parts of this was bring back people who'd worked on the original series, specifically David Elliott to direct, uh, and Mary Turner who came into Puppeteer for a couple of days. Action! Turn! I don't get the lock stockings. Watch out for guards! Oh, it reminds me of the earlier days coming back to this this place. Well, it was weird. As soon as I opened the door there, I was at home. It doesn't feel any different, especially when Mary comes. Yeah, <laughs> it's bang, it's just the same. Yeah. It was incredible when David and Mary were working together because it, they both immediately came back to their working relationship they'd had all those years ago. Well, we're very yes. lucky. We've been friends for over 50 years, haven't we? Yes, <laughs> yes. we've been together for 50 yeah. years. <laughs> you soon get back into it again, I think. Well, um, to be honest, you've never gone out of it. Are you ready? Yeah. Running. Action. And he manages to knock out the automatic TV cameras too. Exactly. It's almost as if he's a phantom. Yep, that's the one. Print. 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 Cool. Print. Every single shot that we do takes a lot of preparation, it, days and days of preparation before you actually get it before the camera. David Tremont, for instance, spent a good few weeks building this beautiful mansion that we knew was going to be blown up in seconds. The most exciting thing has to be the mansion exploding. The initial stages is sitting down with the directors, designers, whomever, and getting out of their head what they see, what, what they imagine it to be. What sort of explosion, how big we can make the model. It has to be built specifically so that it destructs in a certain way. Uh, you don't want the model to just kind of go like that. You want bits of it flying off. You want debris flying towards the camera. You know, that, that's a huge staple of Thunderbirds explosions, little things flying away towards the camera. You've got to build it extremely fragile as there's a lot more technology, as it were, goes into making something to come apart. And when we put the trees in, it looked fantastic. And people, when we mentioned, hey, look at this, isn't it beautiful, would be appalled when we said, it's going to be blown up, it's not going to exist next week. I get this a lot, I've built many 
pyro models uh, over the years and that first reaction is always oh you, you don't want to see your model destroyed but no completely opposite to that no, a pyro model is purpose-built to be destroyed that's the whole challenge of the project when we're trying to recreate the kinds of explosions that Derek Meddings and his team produced for the original Thunderbirds, again, there's a very specific look to them, often because they were using quite dangerous things. Numerous chemicals they were using were carcinogenic, which we can't use now, but those chemicals produce very specific sort of looks. You know, black smoke turns up everywhere in Thunderbirds when there's an explosion. There's usually this toxic stuff which you wouldn't want to breathe in and you can't use now because it's illegal. One of the challenges for our pyrotechnicians was to go away, look at what they were doing and then try and come up with something that was the equivalent of what they were using so that we could achieve the same sort of look. It requires working a lot with the pyrotechnicians, you know, designing what sort of explosion, what sort of sequences, how many, how big. That's the larger charge that we would suspend in a roof um, to blow the roof off and the timbers. And then we have others here which will fire vertically in the air, producing flame at the same time. The pyro guys come in, put all their charges into it, then once they're all finished, they move out, then I go in and fill it every gap I can with debris. You know, Tremont spent weeks and weeks building this model and it's all in one shot, it's going to blow up and if it doesn't work we can't do it again. So we actually put two cameras on it just in case to make sure that we got it um, because we'd never be able to set that up again. You just uh, yeah, hope that it, it works. So when it exploded it just went pow. If you were to, to come into the studio and watch us shooting the special effects, to be honest, it all looks a bit rinky-dink. When we set off an explosion, it's not a huge fireball, it's and it's gone. One. And that's why shooting at high speed is very important. You're shooting at a higher frame rate than normal film. Normal film runs at 24 frames per second, so in one second, you get 24 separate images that are taken by the camera. High speed photography you could be doing, you know, for our explosion shots we did 120 frames per second. So it's a lot of pictures in that one second and then you play that back at 24 frames per second and everything happens really slowly. Tiny little becomes oh. And that applies to, to the models as well. When you've got models on strings flying across the screen, they tend to bump and wobble. If you shoot it at high speed, and then when you play it back normally, the, the bumps and wobbles become sort of you know, gentle turbulence. It just feels right. The craft have weight. They feel like they're actually suspended in midair. I think the original AP Films crew definitely formed a family, particularly in the earlier days, running up to and including Thunderbirds. A super marionation is such a silly form of filmmaking. As great as it looks on screen, the actual day-to-day -day process of it, the reality is so silly it would be very difficult, I think, not to form some sort of camaraderie with the team around you. And to all work together to make this has been a, a very, very special experience. I think this type of filmmaking with puppets, visual effects, has definitely got a future. It's quite telling that every time Thunderbirds has made a comeback um, to different generations of children, each generation has taken to it so much. Doing something using these almost extinct Super Mario Nation techniques isn't just a matter of nostalgia. It can't be. There are a lot of fans on our crew, but there are a lot of professionals who don't have a particular childhood fondness for the series. And they're all able to see the appeal. I think it's got a, a huge future because I think it's um, it's a physical art. Absolutely all the traditional art should be retained, should be passed on, should be taught to you know, the next generation of special effects artists. To be embracing what they were doing 50 years ago would be very, very important because we are the sort of last generation to be doing this and this is a real old school filmmaking course. So uh, I'd like to think that there is that this isn't the end, that there is more to come from this.
Thunderbirds are definitely go.